Success Insight shares the stories of the people with passion and drive who make things happen in the world. Here's your host, Howard Fox. Hello, everyone, and welcome back for another episode of the Outdoor Adventure Series on the Success Insight Podcast. The Outdoor Adventure Series celebrates individuals and families businesses, and organizations that seek out and promote the exploration of the great outdoors. Our guest today is Matthew Dickerson. Matthew began writing about fishing and environmental issues in 1997 with an award-winning newspaper column in Middlebury, Vermont. He is the author of numerous books on fly fishing and river health throughout the U.S., He's also the author of three novels of historical fiction, three fantasy novels, and several books on the theological and moral aspects of the work of J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. Matthew is also the manager, editor, and feature writer for Trout Downstream, an online magazine, and his most recent book, A Fine Spotted Trout on Coral Creek, on the cutthroat competition of native trout in the Northern Rockies has just been published. Matthew, welcome to the Outdoor Adventure Series on the Success Insight Podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Fantastic. Now, I have to share, Matthew, as I was preparing the introduction, and we could have gone a number of different directions because we, we interview a lot of book authors. You've got quite the background in, in the writing, and, and I... I have to ask this first question. Do you enjoy writing? Oh, yeah. It's probably obvious. I really like to write. It's one of the best ways I learn. I write to learn. I write to explore. I am write to figure out what I'm thinking. Sometimes I don't really know what I'm thinking until I write it. I love that. And, you know, I was, I was half expecting you to say, Howard, you have a firm grasp of the obvious. But I, somebody once said that to me. I thought that was funny. But how... Did you get started with writing? Did did this come natural? Did you, you know, watch your your siblings, your parents, grandparents write? How, where did this uh, love of writing come from? I think it probably began with the love of reading. My father ran a little independent bookstore in Boston, and I used to go in to work with him. These were back in the you know the nineteen seventies when you could skip school without getting arrested. And I used to, you know, miss school a couple of times a month and just go in and work with him in his bookstore. And when there was no one in the store, I'd just sit at the front desk as a 10-year-old or 11-year-old or 12-year-old reading voraciously. And so I think my love of reading is what led to an interest in, in writing. Now, the the small independent bookstore, uh, and I have to say, I think this is very cool you know, that you could have a place to go and have fun and sit down and, and read. Was it a kind of a cavernous store? Was it small, you know, narrow aisles and books up to the ceiling? <laughs> it was pretty, it was pretty small. I mean, rent, rent in um, Harvard Square and then later in Kenmore Square, when you opened it in Kenmore Square, Boston was pretty expensive. So I don't think they could really afford a big cavernous store. Was it just books, music? And, and the reason I'm asking this is besides having a Starbucks in Cancun when I've had an especially bad day at the office and mm. through work, I always dream about, you know, the straw tent with the ceiling fan and all I'm serving our ice espressos. And coming back here in the U.S., I think yeah, it must be fun to have an independent bookstore and a coffee shop all in the same spot. Oh, yeah. I love the places where you can go do that. But even even without the coffee shop, Most people who run independent bookstores are doing it because they love books and they like people, they love literature. It's not something you typically get into or you'll ever get into to make a lot of money. So the people there are just doing it out of the love of the sort of people who go there and the books that they can sell. So I'm I'm very fortunate to live in a town that has a little independent bookstore. Very good. Very good. Now, as you discovered your love of writing through the reading, what direction did your profession take in terms of, you know, you graduate high school, going to go to college, what kind of decisions did you make there? I also love the outdoors and I love camping. And when I was in high school, I was, I was sort of boxed in by a couple of teachers. I was told I was not a humanities person. I was told I was not a writer or a literature person, that I was a science person. And so I believed them. I was afraid of writing. And I just thought, okay, I love the outdoors. I'm going to go to college in a, uh, you know, a science-related field. 
Um, I actually studied computer science at college. And my goal in doing that was in part because I was good at it and I did it well. But I thought, well, this is a job I can have that would allow me to work anywhere in the country and make a decent salary that I could afford my expensive outdoor habit. As you may have noticed, sometimes fishing equipment can cost a pretty penny. I figured I wanted to be able to work anywhere in the country and afford to do some of the things I like. And then when I got to college and and I had to take some literature courses, I found that I loved them. I found that I I could write. I had some teachers who helped me write and sort of new doors were open to me there. Not instead of computer science, but sort of as, as doing both of those things at once, continuing to study literature and study writing while also pursuing my interest in software. I love that. And, you know, growing up, yeah, typically it's it's our parents, perhaps older siblings, but uh, you hear about students, they say something like, you shouldn't do this, you can't do this, you're not good at doing this. And that just sets us down this path of having what we call limiting beliefs that co- go with us for the rest of our lives. Oh, yeah. It's, it's unfortunate that there'd be these teachers in high school who would kind of limit me that way and tell me, oh, don't do this because I, I can't get good at it. And that I believe them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, you know, kudos to your your teachers in college who helped you to to rediscover this gift that you had. When you were growing up, had you always gone out with family to nature and to the camping? Is Was that just part of what the family did or how did you get involved with that? Yeah, I think my, my parents certainly enjoyed outdoor activities. I think um, my mom was a uh, had studied literature and she she taught in elementary school and middle school and her love was teaching literature. So I think I got some of that from my mom, but my dad grew up in Michigan and he grew up on going on canoeing wilderness trips in Michigan with his family in the 50s and out into Ontario and to lakes and rivers in Ontario. So when I was just eight years old, he took me up to Northern Maine to the Allagash Wilderness Waterway. And we had, a I think, a four night, five day camping and fishing trip and that was just a couple of years after the, it was established as a wilderness waterway. So it was protected. It was the first place I ever saw loons or moose or osprey or bitterns. You know, it was just a very transformative experience in the imagination of this eight-year-old who was used to polluted rivers and cities to suddenly just see the, the beauty of a place that's been protected. I, I love that. I, I never... And I I've, actually have shared this with some writers uh, from the Wisconsin uh, Outdoor Communicators Association. I had attended their annual conference this year, and and I had shared with a couple of couple of the folks, Dan Small and, and Patrick Durkin, that and they were on the podcast as well. And I shared I had never been fishing. I couldn't find my way through a pole, figure out what lure to use or what type of. Um, uh, See now I'm drawing a blank, Matthew. Is the the thing that goes on the fishing pole that you wind? Yeah, the reel. That thing called. Yeah, the reel. That's it. <laughs> yeah. I knew, I knew it was there. I mean, it was it was deep down in the vault. I would have eventually uh, remembered this, but I've never. I my neighbor was a big time fisherman, and I remember he gave me some poles and some lures and the reel, but I never did anything with it. And and it just it was so fun to hear other people's stories at this conference and then kind of reading about your books and the fly fishing and travel. And, and I, I love the fact too, that you also integrated not only the, the historical nature of it, but also the, the environmental aspects of it as well. So when you began to really coalesce around this topic of fishing, fly fishing, river health, how did that begin to coalesce for you? Like, this is where I want to put my energy and help educate and inform people like me who literally have never done it. I think there's probably two parts of the answer to that. One may be just more, you know, my own selfish interest when you when you begin to realize that some of the places that you really love and that inspire you are that way because somebody has put in the effort or the, or the laws to protect those places. The reason that there's so much beauty and clean water and, and forests and uh, wildlife and say, and, you know, some of the national parks or national forests or the Allagash Wilderness Waterways is that they're protected. But I think there's a lot more than that, really, that's that the more I learned, the more it impacted me, which is just 
uh, as I think uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer writes in, in Braiding Sweetgrass, that all flourishing is mutual is one way of putting it. Or another way of putting it is we really all do live downstream of one another. So anything that any of us do ultimately impacts other people. Polluting the water, dumping mine refuse or toxic chemicals in the water harms everybody. And ecosystems are so independent that it's really true that something that happens in a forest in Mexico can impact bears in Canada. Something that happens 90 miles upriver from the ocean in, in Alaska can impact the whole food system out in the ocean. And so I think the more you realize that, you realize we can't just disconnect systems and, and think that you can treat one system one place really terribly and, and have it not impact everybody else and everything else. So there's just, a, there's just a lot at stake. The way we care for the world around us impacts everybody. You know, a question that I might typically ask at the end of a, an interview is about hope. And, you know, your, your topics and some of your peers who are also writing, and for our listeners, I met Matthew through the Outdoor Writers Association of America, an organization that we are both a member of. And I hear other people... Who, uh, echoing a very similar aspect of the, the importance of conservation, awareness, education. And I always ask them about hope. And I guess asking you right now is, do you have hope for our stewardship of this of this land we live in? We live in the United States. There's a lot of, you know, geographic areas, you know, uh, waterways, bodies of water streams, you know, the, the de I live in the desert in, in Las Vegas area. What, what Do you have hope for we are going to be better stewards of the land going forward? Or what are your concerns right now? And how are you also writing about this? Uh, you've just given me like five hours worth of a uh, wonderful conversation that we could have. We could do that if you want. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, you know, there's certainly things that, 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 give me, that give me fear and concern. Uh, the impacts of climate change, and it, it's pretty easy to see if you look at fires in the West and flooding and major storms in the South Central and Southeast and Northeast lately. There's certainly a lot out there that's that makes me fearful. But I also have a lot of reasons for hope. A lot of them have come from good stewardship and good care of places that I have visited. The fact that, you know, the Allegance Wilderness Waterway exists and that 50 years ago, that the protections were put in place to help that place keep, you know, keep from being developed or, you know, back, you go back to the 70s and you have the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. They've made a tremendous difference. A lot of rivers in Vermont, in some ways, are in better shape than they were 40 years ago. Um, at least, for example, in terms of acid, there's um, acid rain is is uh, much less of an issue now than it was in the 1970s. So there are, other, there are other ways that things have gotten worse, but there's some ways that things have gotten better. So I've certainly seen some efforts. Uh, I've seen a lot of efforts in places um, from Maine to uh, to the Southern Appalachians, the Rocky Mountains. Um, to to restore not just na some native important native fish, but to try to uh, restore and recover some of the waterways where they live. You know, people putting money into tearing out old culverts that block migration, keep fish from spawning, and replacing them with you know natural stream bottoms. There have been dams removed, tremendously damaging dams that have destroyed fish runs, both in the Northeast and the, and the Northwest. And fish are returning. Uh, alewives are returning to the coast of Maine. So there are a lot of promising stories that do give me hope. And there's things that I know I can do that, that will make a difference that also gives me hope. What are some of those things that you are doing to help promote this hope? Well, in terms of climate change, certainly working to reduce my own carbon footprint. You know, cutting down on driving, we are recently able to find a used electric car to put in solar panels at our house, you know, and I think that way cuts down our carbon footprint. When we have had some work done lately, we've been replacing, uh, you know, non-native grasses with a lot of wildflowers and native grasses and clovers that don't need to be mowed or don't need to be mowed as often, which support pollinators. So those are things that I think I can do as an individual. 
I also hope that my writing impacts people. I spent several years in, in a lot of my stories and articles trying to let people know about how horrible the proposed pebble mine would have been in the Bristol Bay in Alaska, putting a toxic heavy metal mine with, with probably the world's largest toxic heavy metal tailings pond in the world at the headwaters of where 50% of the world's wild caught sockeye salmon are harvested. And there have been some big decisions in the past year that have, I think, really put a major block on that dam. So that, you know, that was hopeful to me that not, not the dam, but the mine. It was hopeful to me that there's been some major steps that I think will make it very hard for that mine to get put in. And I hope people continue to oppose it. So those are some of the things that have been hopeful to me and some of the things where I, I feel like I, I maybe have made a difference. I love that. And I, I and that's, that it's an, it's an amazing effort. And, and what I love about it is, is many, and I can probably be on the, that side, this side of kind of staying on the sidelines until the last minute. But I think it, it sounds like you're on, you're, you're on the front and center of what it means to be a, a steward, not only in your backyard, but, you know, throughout the U.S. and perhaps, you know, Canada, Mexico, et cetera. Because if we don't take care of our planet, I mean, as you, and from that quote, uh, everything is downstream. <laughs> so. Yeah. And and there's you know, there's certainly people doing a lot more than I am. Sure. I did you know I, did, I will say and this is a little, a, bit, a little bit of promotion for my for my publisher. But um, I was artist in residence residence at Glacier National Park back in 2017, and one of the things they learned there is that the entire park, which I think I think um, employs about 800 people in the summer and quite a few people year round. The entire budget for this one million acre park and 800 employees is only about 12 or 13 million dollars a year, which is less than, you know, a significant number of professional athletes make. Yeah. And here, here they're, you know, they're, they're, they're paying salaries for 800 people and trying to manage a million acres. So my new book, which just came out this week, I've signed out over all the royalties for that book to the, to, um, Glacier National Park Conservancy so that the royalties will, go to helping projects to to protect and conserve and preserve the land in that park, to, you know, to, to support the mission of the park. And my publisher has put in a matching matching funds. So double, double my royalties will now go to um, Glacier National Park Conservancy. Fantastic. And, and we're both definitely, you know, we would chat about this later is, you know, provide all the links back uh, to the new book and, and also to the Glacier National Park Conservancy. You know, let's start to get into the books now. So your most current book, it's just been published, uh, I think it was September 1st, so just a couple of days ago. Congratulations. That's fantastic. Thank you. This book, A Fine Spotted Trout on Coral Creek on the Cutthroat Competition of Native Trout in the Northern Rockies. How did this book evolve for you? I mean, it's a, it seems like a very specific topic. Obviously, trout, that, that's a consistent theme through your writing. Why this book? Well, part of it is flowed out of what I learned, began learning really over uh, quite a number of years. But I think the last six or seven years, it's really it's really come um, even more clear, which is the importance of native fish. I think as a fly fisherman, as someone who loves trout, I think I probably grew up with this idea that all trout are equal. You know, I, I just like catching trout. It doesn't matter if it's a brook trout or a rainbow trout or a brown trout. And um, and I always used to, I would even drive by a river or a stream and I'd imagine, well, if I owned that property, here's what I'd do. I'd put, I'd put a dam here or, or build a pond here, or I'd put in, you know, stock it with all these different fish. And I'd try to, to engineer it or manage it to fit my desires. But that's really just the false view of the world. I'll give one example. I... Non-native lake trout um, found their way into um, Yellowstone Lake uh, many years ago. Probably were illegally stocked, though it's certainly possible that something like a bird, you know, carried one in it. Um, it's it's most likely the case that they were illegally stocked at some point. And those non-native lake trout have devastated the cutthroat population of the lake. It is in the early when they first really took over, I think as as much as a ninety percent collapse in the cutthroat trout population because you know each lake trout can eat 40 
cut throat a year. And they would just sit at the, at the mouth of the feeding streams or the, or the spawning streams when the cut throat were spawning and devour them. And that ripples out to the whole ecosystem because cutthroat trout, which are native and which spawn in shallow waters, they're an accessible protein to, to so many different creatures that live in that greater Yellowstone uh, ecosystem. Grizzly bears would sit and feed on and eat spawning cutthroat the way that they will eat salmon in Alaska and bald eagles and osprey and otters. And, and so much of the ecosystem is co-evolved and adapted over 15,000 years to native cutthroat trout. You throw in lake trout and, and they're simply not an available protein to other species. L- lake trout don't spawn in shallow waters. They they're typically can't be caught or eaten by a grizzly bear. And so one of the things that's happened is there was a, a massive collapse in the osprey population because of lake trout. So I think at one point, uh, a couple of decades ago, or even more recently, there were 65 nesting pairs of osprey around Yellowstone Lake. And that number dropped to just five. And I think only three of them successfully had chicks um, just a couple of years ago. So the illegal introduction of lake trout into Yellowstone Lake caused a collapse in the population of osprey. So I think it was kind of a learning about how important native fish are that got me interested in writing about native fish in different parts of the country and how important they are. So I spent a lot of 2016 in Wyoming and Montana. And then 2017, went back and was artist in residence at Glacier National Park. So I had a chance to talk with some of the top fishery biologists in the country who really know those areas from the National Forest Service and National Park Service and USGS and, and learn a lot. Just um, a lot of what I share in my book are just things that were that I've been learning over the past five or six years. And of course, it's a beautiful place to be. I, I can't deny that. It's a shame you have to hang out there. And Right, exactly. I, that's been the uh, other downside. And I don't mean downside necessarily in a bad way. But when I interview someone like yourself up in the Northwest and or Northeast, or you know, so you know, someone from uh, Montana, Idaho, Oregon. I'm thinking, okay, that's only a 12 hour drive from Las Vegas. I think I can do this because yeah. I mean, these amazing places that, yeah. that some many of us would just never get to. Yeah. So I am curious though about you know, you, as you've described the book, are there solutions to the issue? How how can we as you know? citizens and you know uh supporters of the park help to resolve this problem or is it resolvable can it be fixed well there's a lot of good stuff going on in a lot of these national forests and national parks um one of them has been a, a real re-emphasis on managing for native fish uh, rather than for example stocking a lot of non-native fish there's been a lot of efforts as i already mentioned for example in the southern southwestern Wyoming and the Bridger Teton National Forest, um, a lot of effort to restore the habitat for fish by, you know, one of the, be- one of the best ways is replacing a, a culvert, which is a t- terrible, not only really blocks fish migration, but also can change, can cause siltation in the water, can change the temperature of the water. And you take out one of these metal culverts and replace it with just a natural stream bottom bridge crossing, and it can make a dramatic positive influence. And, you know, they can cost maybe twenty to $30,000 each to do one. So it's not a huge amount of money that you're talking about. Um, and some of that work is going on. So I think, you know, one is, just, is supporting, not even sometimes with donations, uh, nonprofit organizations or groups that help to, to do that work, conservation organizations that do that work. We can support them with their funds. We can also, in the way we vote, um, vote for representatives in, in public office who will defend public lands, who will support the budgets of places like Glacier National Park or the um, U.S. Forest Service, who will, who will provide budget for the important scientific work and preservation work, and conservation work that goes on in those, in those places. So I think, you know, there's certainly things we can do with our votes, um, with our money. Sure. And uh, I'll tell you another thing is, is uh, water use. Water conservation is, 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 is and will grow to be an even greater issue with climate change. 
so climate change is going to is going to impact things. Um, the biologists that I've talked to, though, in in a lot of places, say that that cutthroat trout and a lot of these species, they their their range may shift a little bit, but there's there's a good chance that in a lot of places they will survive and adapt to climate change as long as we can get rid of other stressors in the environment. But if they're having to adapt to climate change and also deforestation and mining and oil spills and invasive species, then all of a sudden the odds are dramatically stacked against them. Sure. So any of the other stressors we can get rid of in the system that is really helpful. Oh, no doubt. And you know what I would love? Matthew, I'm going to give you a little homework, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Uh, in addition to Glacier National Park and the Conservancy, yeah. if yeah. there are other organizations, you know, the Department of Natural Resources, the you know of the other stewards or the governmental stewards of our land or nonprofits, if there's ones that you you know through your writing and just conversations that you would recommend our listeners to learn more about, I would love you know, three or four that you, you could share. And we'll put those in our show notes uh, as well. Do you, have, you want me to give them now or you want me to, to email them to you later? Well, why don't you go ahead and email them or, or if okay. you want to men, mention them now, why don't you I go mean, ahead? Go uh, ahead. You know, different, different organizations have different, um, have slightly different goals. And one of the things to do is to research the organizations mm-hmm. um, and, and find out which ones align with you. But I mean, Nature Conservancy, tra- I've been um. I've been a member of Trout Unlimited. Backcountry uh, hunters and anglers is another one that's that's you know has a strong conservation focus. So these are some of the groups that I've been a, a part of. Um, you know, some folks might want to look into uh, National Wildlife Federation or Audubon. Um, there, there's a lot of national nonprofit organizations that have a strong conservation focus. And again, you, you everyone might not like everything about every one of those organizations. But if you look up some of them, you're going to find some whose vision, uh, you know, aligns pretty closely with yours. It may not be perfect 100 percent, but, you know, if you can find a group that has a 95, you know, 90 percent of their vision aligns closely with yours, you know, find that group and support it. Um, It's not just the dollars you give, but even just the number of members, you know, if Trout Unlimited, for example, you know, if they have a certain, if they have a certain number of, you know, tens of thousands of members, that gives them more lobbying power when they go to approach Congress um, to pass, you know, water rights. I mean, uh, uh, water conservation bills. Sure, sure. So some, that's that gives some of these organizations, again, like some of the ones I've mentioned. Um, Trout Unlimited, especially for me, because of the river conservation work, that gives them maybe some power beyond just the the budget that they get just by having members uh, who, you know, members that when they go to Congress, they say, here's how many members we have. Here's how many members we are representing. And and these are, um, these are laws that we think would be really important. That makes total sense. Total sense. And we'll definitely include, you know, this information uh, once again in, in the show notes. And something dawns on me as you were describing you know this work, and especially the book uh, about the you know the native the native fish you know up in um, Glacier National Park. Is your other books the your books are kind of a I don't know there's 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 again it's a choice of words I probably eclectic. haven't had enough cough eclectic yeah <laughs> uh, but it's a mixture of story. A mixture mixture of education. It's also a mixture of art because you know pictures, descriptions, you know, visualizing this beauty that's out there in our, in in nature, whether it's a national park or a a stream up in the up in northern Vermont in the in the Allagash Wilderness Waterway. Your your books are really providing a little bit of everything to your to the reader. Well, thanks. I appreciate you you. Noticing that, I mean, I really came into writing as a novelist. My first book published was a historical novel, and uh, you know, I I think I'd say at the at the core of it, I'm I'm a storyteller. I'm a I'm a narrative writer. So even when we talk about these environmental issues, uh, I'm in in some of my books, I'm not writing an environmental treatise. I'm not writing as a journalist per se. I I try to learn a lot. I try to convey a lot of information in my books. 
But at the core, I'm really, I'm really telling true stories and trying to draw readers into the narratives. You know, I, I said I learned about, I learned a lot about native fish in the, in the Rockies, um, native cutthroat trout, talking to these biologists uh, for the Park Service and National and, and Forest Service and USGS. But I also learned a lot about them by sitting in a stream and, and casting a fly and, and holding the fish and seeing what they're eating and seeing what the insects are in the stream. So a lot of it's just personal experience. And, and as a writer, I want to tell a captivating story. I want to write a story and write it well so that even people like you who don't go out and fish very often or don't fish ever will be drawn into the storytelling, drawn into the pictures, the, the, the word pictures. And I think that's part of the way that we share, share with people our delight in the world, to share with people the beauty of the world um, is through story, is, is kind of imaginatively through good writing. Very good, very good. And I am curious, as a, as a, a trout uh, angler, fly fisherman, I would imagine, and I think there's something about this culture of, of, of fishermen that it's kind of like they carry their, their, their rod, the reel and the flies everywhere they go. Uh, and so anywhere there's a stream and I know there's trout, I'm there. Yeah. You nailed uh, me. You got me on that one. <laughs> I do have a, um, I do have a couple, um, eight piece, a couple, uh, travel rods. Um, I got them a few years ago from Ella Bean and I love them. Um, and I can pack them up in in the even a carry on suitcase. They pack down to just thirteen inches, and so almost any place I'm going for business or travel, the first thing I do is look up. Okay, where can I go fish when I'm in that area? And is there any place close by? And I and if there's any chance of fishing, I bring that I bring that rod and bring a few flies with me. It's um, it's actually can be really bad because. I'll go on a trip and maybe it's a trip that should earn me, uh, you know, $800 or something for speaking someplace or, or something. And then I'll, I'll take $400 or $500 of the $800 that I just earned and use it to, to spend two extra nights and get a hotel and hire a guide. I, I, I often make a lot less money on these, on these so-called working trips than I'm supposed to because of this characteristic that you just very nicely identified. <laughs> There's no such thing as a work trip for me. Everything is a fishing trip. You know, it, it's really interesting because I, I, I feel the same way, although different, is I like to just get out out of the city into the desert. I mean, that's why I took an opportunity out here in the, in the Southwest. I love the stars. I love yeah. the desert. I like going and taking pictures of the Milky Way. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm all about. So, you know, in that dry air, you can see the dry air and higher elevations. You can see things that you don't necessarily see very often, in, in even in rural New England. Oh, no doubt. Now, you should read my book, I, Trout in the Desert. By the way, I, you know, something I'm, I'm literally staring right at the titles of your books, yeah. and that's the one. of like, that's the one that's I'm very interested in. Yeah. So, for our listeners, this is Trout in the Desert uh, on fly fishing, human habits, and the cold waters of the air in Southwest. So, uh, Matthew, I'm going to be all over that book. I know what my holiday reading is going to be. You're adding to that list, by the way. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> now, will you be attending the uh, Outdoor Writers Association of America's annual conference up in Vermont this year? I am absolutely attending that. I'm looking forward to it. There's a great list of pre-conference trips and post-conference trips. I've signed up for one of the pre-conference trips. I'm actually going out with, uh, I've signed up for one going out with one of the, I think, state um, wardens or fisheries people to to actually look at and fish this, uh, landlocked salmon stream in Vermont. There's a great list of workshops. I've In past trips to the OWA meeting, I've met magazine editors and directly ended up um, with some connections to write some pieces for various magazines. And I've got some, just some nice, some good friendships I've made with OWAA fellow members over the past few years. In fact, I'm not just going to um, this year here in Vermont, but I'm already planning and it's already on my books to go next year when it will be held in Wyoming. So the next two years, I'm already planning and going. I, I love it. And, and uh, count me in. So you, you and I will meet in uh, Vermont this year. So I'm, I am attending as well. Uh, right. And I am, I'm like debating right now. There's a particular camera lens that I want. I don't need it. And, you know, I, I don't make, I love photography. I don't make my money at it. I make my money yeah. in podcasting and coaching. Yep. And so I'm really like, 
should I, should I not? You know, I, I'm actually think this is actually an end of life decision, by the way, because, you know, I'm like 61. This is the last 100 to 400 millimeter lens I'm ever going to buy. So that's a little existential conversation I'm having with myself right now. But there, I'm going to... I'm in the same boat, by the way. <laughs> I'm, I, I can't really make money as a photographer. Um, but I do have to do photography for my, for my fishing stories. So it's hard for me to justify the new lens that I really want. And yet I'm really working hard to justify it. And I'm about the same, I'm about the same age as you. So I realize whatever I get, it's probably going to last me the rest of my writing career. <laughs> well, see, but you, in your books, you have pictures. So that's a business expense. You know, I, I talk for a little bit. Yeah, okay. Uh, but, you know, whatever. But I, you, we, it's a business expense, but that's very different than saying it'll ever actually get paid for. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, I, I'm very excited to to meet you when we get to the conference. I joined OWAA this year, and I'm excited. It's been a, uh, a lot of the members have been great guests uh, on the podcast, and I just think it's an opportunity to explore a culture of folks that I've never been a part of, you know, through, through my own work as a former IT guy and as a, as a business coach, but you know, you're moving out to the Southwest, all of a sudden I can go car camping and I can do my dark sky photography and landscape photography. And it's like, it's wonderful. And, you know, so many opportunities to, and I can't read your book now. Now I'm like, if I read the book, I want to go visit wherever those waters are. And well, so, you're close to some of them. Yeah, and I'm going to have to learn how to fish too. I think I think that's uh, that's going to be on the list. I, I don't know what I forgot what workshop I signed up for, but uh, even the pre workshop, there was a couple of stories that you know kind of stick with you for a while. This overall experience is there. What could you, you know, you, you as an educator, as a writer, and you know, for magazines, the books. What are some of the stories that stand out for you and the experiences and and kind of another layer to that is how have you changed as a result of those stories, those experiences? You know, that, that's a great question. I, I, I hope I'm continuously open to, to changing and to being changed and to being influenced by what I learned. Um, I, I really already did share one way that I think in the past, even the past 10 years or so, that I have changed. Um, and, and, you know, that's just the way that I look at the world. I I really did used to, you know, every time I'd approach a stream, I would imagine how I would shape that stream to meet my desires, you know? Oh, if I, if I, if I had a house in the stream or if I lived near it, here's where I would want to, you know, put a little pond or divert the water or make a waterfalls. And here's the type of fish I would want to stock in the stream because they're the types of fish I want to catch. And, you know, now it's much more like, well, what, what would, what does that stream look like uh, if it's healthy? What is the, what is the river look like? What are its native fish and how is it part of the ecosystem? And how do the insects that live in that stream impact the spiders and impact the songbirds? And um, how does the fish that live in the stream interact with everything else? How does a forest impact the stream? How does a mature forest impact the streams that flow through the forest and, and vice versa? So rather than going someplace and wanting to impose my my ideas of, of what it could be for my own sake, I, I want to go and learn. I want to go and, and experience it and just be attentive to it. I think, um, and I, maybe that word attentive gets at another area. I feel like one of the ways I've changed in the last 10 years is just growing more, um, more attentive, more, more willing to just sit and listen and watch and pay attention and pay attention to the, to the little details. What, what is the insect that's crawling across that rock and, and why is it important? And where does it come from? And and whose life impacts that insect? And whose life is impacted by that insect? I love it. Yeah. And this summer, I got to spend uh, time with uh, two other instructors and 10 students in Alaska for three weeks. Uh, I was up there with these, uh, helping co-teach a class on narrative nonfiction, nature and environmental writing. And, um, and that was just a great, great group of students. And uh, they inspired me. They gave me hope because... 
they weren't there just looking to make money. They weren't there just looking for quick answers. They were really willing to listen and to learn. And we had a couple of pretty significant experiences, um, you know, camping out and, and, and holding class wherever we were, whatever was happening, that was our class. And one day we were camped in Ketchumac Bay State Park. Um, out on the, you know, the, the edge of a pretty massive wilderness. Mm-hmm. And this commercial fishing boat came up to the beach and they started setting some purse, purse things, uh, purse nets. They did three passes by our beach and it was fun to watch. And they were, they were really kind when they were done. They, they threw a couple of fresh salmon, like right out of the ocean. We watched them catch the salmon and then they boated over to shore and threw two, two of us, two of them to us for dinner. Oh, wow. So we were able to, to fillet those salmon right up on the beach that night as a class. Well, it doesn't get better than that. <laughs> nope. But as we're talking to the, to the one of the women um, who was running the skiff, uh, she commented they had just caught a 300 pound, um, a pound halibut the day before. Uh, and that is an old, mature breeding halibut. And she made this comment. She said it with a really sad face. She said, if I were a millionaire, I would have, I would have thrown that halibut back. Cause that fish is as a mature fish. It's older than I am. And it's really important to the, to the ecosystem. Cause that's a fish that's capable of laying this huge amount of eggs. But she said, but I'm not a millionaire and everybody in the boat got a thousand dollars out of the sale of that fish, that one fish. Right. So they kept it, you know, just that story made me, I'm in no way judgmental of, of her. This is someone working really hard to make a living, to make ends meet someone who has to pay, pay, you know, or pay rent and buy gas and buy food and pay taxes and, uh, and pay insurance, pay for health insurance. You know, so I can fully understand them catching that mature 300 pound halibut, um, even though it was a mature breeding fish. But it does make us question the whole economy uh, that puts pressure on somebody like that to keep a fish like that. And, and, and even just asking questions, how could we live with a different economy in which all flourishing was mutual? How could we live with an economy in which that, that person would have been more, that, that woman would have been more motivated to release that halibut back into the water and that that would have been a better decision for her? So those are tough questions. And, and that, that story is still what I'm, I'm wrestling with. I don't know the answer. You know, I, I, I really appreciate you sharing that. And it's, you know, I'd asked earlier, do you have hope? And, Within that hope and within a story like this, there there is deep down of what type of society do we want to live in? And yes, you know, I've I've always described to all boats rise when the tide comes in. I don't know where that quote came from, but it's just something I, I've held with me for as long as I can remember. And we shouldn't have to make those kinds of decisions to should I, as you just shared keep the fish, you know, and pay the rent, et cetera, pay the bills or do what probably was the, the, I don't know. I don't even know if I should say the right thing to do, which is to let it back and let it continue to do what it's been doing for 30 some years of, or however long it was been in the water is spawning more, you know, more fish as a result. So hard, hard questions. And what's next for you, Matthew? Well, I'm actually um, working on two books. Uh, my next work, uh, my next nonfiction book is going to be about Alaska. It's going to be about Bristol Bay and the native fish that I'll be writing most about, center of a book, are going to be, well, multiple species of, of char. Um, char is a genus that includes five, five fish we call trout or char in North America. Three of them are native to that region of Alaska, Dolly Varden trout, Arctic char and lake trout are all species of char. So I'm going to be putting together several years of experiences um, in Katmai National Park and Lake Clark National Park and other waters up in the Bristol Bay watershed and telling a book about Dolly Varden trout in in the Bristol Bay. Um, I'm also working on finishing up a, a fantasy novel that I've been working on for several years. I probably have three chapters to go and a little bit of polishing and then shipping it off to to uh, look for a publisher. Fantastic. Well, when the fantasy novels uh, 
you know, get published, do let me know. And then we have you back on. We'll just add you to one of our other genres in the success insight. Yeah, we can have a conversation someday about Tolkien and C.S. Lewis and the outdoor aspects of of their storytelling. I love that. I love that. Last and final question, I promise. If our listeners would like to learn more about you and your work, whether it's the websites, the book sites, magazines, where are the best places to get to know you? A lot of my outdoor writing, particularly my fishing writing, can be found on my website, um, droughtdownstream.net. I also have a more general website, just matthewdickerson.net, um, where I share kind of more of my general writing. Um, and I write for a lot of magazines, but I think my books really are the, the best way to get to know who I am and, and see what sorts of things I write about and what sorts of things I care about. So. Um, you know, I, I always love to point people to, people to my books, um, even even the recent one, because I, I can point you to my book, A Fine Spot of Trout in Corral Creek, because I won't get any of the royalties for that. So I don't feel guilty telling you to go check out that book. All the royalties will, will go to Glacier National Park Conservancy. Fantastic. Well, Matthew, it has been an, a pleasure to have you on the Outdoor Adventure Series on Success Inside Podcast. And I hope you have enjoyed the conversation as much as much as I have. And I did. I hope we do it again. I, I certainly do. I, in fact, I know we will. And I am so looking forward to uh, meeting you in person, whether it's a, a, a glass of water adult, or adult beverage, iced tea, whatever, seeing you, meeting you in uh, Vermont uh, next month. So, yeah. Uh, fantastic. And again, once uh, thank you so much for really taking the time uh, out of your day and sharing so much about your work. Again, go get that lens. I want to go look for, I, I, by the way, I live literally right above an REI, which is a very dangerous thing. Oh, yeah. And it's like, uh, yeah. I'm of the size that REI doesn't have my size clothes anymore. I don't know why they think everybody's an XL or smaller, but that's that's, I guess that's my problem, <laughs> but uh, they do have fishing gear. So we'll go see. Thank you so much and talk to you in the future. And I am going to go buy uh, the book about fishing in the wild. All right. Thanks a lot. Take care. All right, folks. Uh, we have just been chatting with uh, Matthew Dickerson, uh, again, writer, environmentalist, author, editor, professor, and really consummate and successful writer. All of these books, whether it's from the historical fiction, the fantasy, the theological moral work with Tolkien, Lewis, but all, but especially these outdoor books, you know, Downstream, Reflections on Brook Trout, Fly Fishing, Reflections on Wild Places, on Places Wild and Almost Wild. And really, it is also his newest book, A, a Fine Spotted Trout on Coral Creek, really just a lot of great information and insights. And I think the the point that really jumped out for me is the, the comment, this quote from Kemmerer, all flourishing is mutual, everything, everything flows downstream. And so anything we do has an effect on something else downstream. And it, it should give us all a moment to pause and reflect on you know, are we making the right decisions? And so we hope you enjoyed uh, today's episode. We are going to provide backlinks to Trout Downstream, the online magazine. You know, we can you can visit uh, his, his writing website, matthewdickerson.net. And we'll also provide links to all of his books on bookshop.org. This is a, an online site that supports the independent bookstores around the country. And that's, I mean, yeah, we can go out to some of the major logo sites, but really if we you know, kind of support our local bookshops, I mean, this is where works uh, like Matthews thrive. So do go out and check out those links. And we'll also provide the various links to the nonprofits, the government agencies that are focused on the stewardship of the great outdoors, whatever that looks like, the mountains, the landscape, the, the trees, the insects, the, and, the, and the fish. And there's a lot going on. And as Matthew said, you might not agree with everything, but find the points you do agree on. And those, perhaps those are the organizations that you could throw your support behind. If you would like to listen to this episode, you can check us out on our Success Inside Podcast webpage. You can also find us on Facebook and on LinkedIn, our Success Inside Podcast business pages. 
We are on just about every podcast platform, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, uh, iHeartRadio, Pandora, and especially Spotify, where we have our Outdoor Adventure Series playlist. So you can listen to this episode as well as any other of our Outdoor Adventure Series episodes on the Success Inside podcast. Okay, folks, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, go out there, have a phenomenal day. We are recording this uh, heading into Labor Day weekend. So hope you have a great holiday yourself and, and a wonderful uh, fall season. Be safe, wear your mask, practice social distancing, You know, take care of yourselves, your family, and you know, help take care of the community as well. We will see you on another episode of the Success Inside podcast and the Outdoor Adventure Series. Take care now. Success Insight is a production of Fox Coaching and First Story Strategies. Find us online, successinsightpodcast.com.